Hey Comp Covers, so this is our second review our second review video for government. So our second topic is the legislature. So in terms of vocabulary, and you're going to see this is how we're going to do the reviews. We're going to start with the vocabulary for the topic, and then we'll go into our country case comparison. So legislatures have the potential to reinforce legitimacy and stability. So these are sources and can be sources of legitimacy and stability, legislatures. And it's done by responding to public demand, open debating policy, facilitating compromise between factions, extending civil liberties, and restricting the power of the executive. So realize that it's a source of legitimacy. It's also a check on the executive. Okay, and uh, in certain countries though, particularly as we're gonna see in Russia and Iran, legislative powers can be constrained by other governmental institutions. And I'll kind of show you what I mean when I go through the country case studies. All right, so this is our vocabulary. So let's start with the UK. So the UK has a parliamentary system, as we already know. Um, it fuses power, so there is a little bit of a connection between the executive and the legislative branch in this parliamentary system. Um, it's often referred to as the Westminster model, um, and it is a bicameral legislature. However, um, it, uh, one, of the, um, one of the houses does have more power than the other, in this case the uh, House of Commons. So let's look at the bicameral legislature in the UK. We have appointed House of Lords. It's been decreasing in size over time. Starting in 1997, um, it became, instead of hereditary, it became light. It became just appointment, right? You got appointed. Um, and basically what the House of Lords does, it's a check on the House of Commons. Um, it reviews bills coming from the House of Commons and can effectively delay those bills um, by adding amendments and, and otherwise de delaying them. So that's the role of the House of Lords. The House of Commons is a much more significant body in a sense that it has more power. Um, it is elected, so it's very democratic. Um, it passes bills. It deals with budgets, so it, pass it, has, it deals with the finance of the government. Um, there, because of the nature of the House of Commons, um, it tends to check it itself, one party checking the other. So there's scrutiny in, involved in the House of Commons. It's policy making because the majority party um, is in control. And so the majority party gets to dictate policy. Um, and the only thing the minority party can do is basically badger them, question them and badger them. Um, and uh, members of the House of Commons, they're called MPs, they are elected ministers of parliament. They are elected to five-year terms. Now, um, the House of Commons generally um, is run by either a majority singular party or a coalition of parties. So um, right now, uh, it's the conservatives. The majority party is the conservative and they had enough to not even need a coalition with another political party. So they have it. Now, a year ago, they had to have a coalition with the DUP. But um, as of the 2018 election, um, they no longer uh, are in need of a, of a coalition. But they often do have a couple of parties who um, are going to form an alliance or coalition in order to have a majority because that's what is necessary in the House of Commons, a majority in order to control every aspect of the House of Commons. So the majority party is in control and writes the agenda and the policies and the legislation for, uh, for the UK's government. The minority party is a check. Um, they scrutinize, they're the watchdog, they have question time, um, and they are part of what is known as the shadow cabinet. You can see right here is the majority party sits on this side and then the minority party sits over here as well as other opposition. The shadow cabinet is basically questions the cabinet members of the majority party, checking them. MPs don't need to live in their districts. Um, backbenchers, let's talk about them. So the backbenchers, they can be on either side. These are junior MPs 
Um, and uh, they are hoping that through time and party loyalty, they will be able to go to the front of the benches instead of backbenching. So let's talk about party loyalty. It's called collective responsibility, and it's a big part of the House of Commons. Loyalty to the party is paramount for, the, for uh, securing a good seat in the House of Commons. So if you prove your loyalty to your party, then you rise up within the party and could potentially get cabinet positions, which um, in order to obtain a cabinet position, you have to be an MP. So it's called collective responsibility. You can argue with your party behind closed doors, but publicly you are lock stock loyal to the party and all of its policies. All right, let's go to Russia. So Russia is a parliamentary hybrid system. It is also bicameral. Um, and uh, increasingly they are losing power. That's the big takeaway here. Um, increasingly both uh, houses, the Duma and the Federal Council, um, are essentially becoming rubber stamp um, legislative uh, houses. So the Duma is the lower house um, and it is elected. Uh, it passes bills, it's in charge of the budget, confirms appointments, something with typical um, houses do. Uh, they're elected to um, five-year terms, um, but the power is limited by the president who can issue decrees that have the force of law. So increasingly we're seeing um, the Duma becoming rubber stamp. The federal council is appointed. So this is the upper house. And it does typical upper house stuff. It approves the bills that came from the Duma. It also um, deals a lot with budget issues, treaties, judicial nominees, troop deployment. Um, can also delay legislation just like the House of Lords. But again, tends to be a rubber stamp body. Um, two members per region are chosen by regional governors. So the appointments are by regional governors who are cho and governors who are chosen by Putin. So again, um, rubber stamp. So what um, and the type of system that exists in Russia, as you can see here from the um, on the 2016 election, is that they have what's known as a dominant party system. Uh, whereas as the UK has a majority party system, um, the Russia has a dominant party. Um, the difference, the dominant party is not necessarily ideological. The dominant party is um, the party that just wins um, and uh, be largely because of Putin. And so United Russia has been the dominant party, um, kind of like the PRI was the dominant party in Mexico. Um, it's basically the only party that, that's, that has any degree of power, whereas the majority party is through election. Um, and sometimes it's one side, sometimes it's the other, but in a dominant party, it stays one party. All right, let's go to China. China's, um, there are only two countries that have unicameral uh, legislatures, and China's one of them. The other is Iran. So um, China has a very unique system. Uh, the People's Republic of China um, has uh, its party controlled, right? It's the Communist Party. And um, the name of their unicameral legislature is the National People's Party. It is, um, it is an elected, but it's elected from uh, lower uh, congresses. Does that make sense? The people don't elect members to the National People's Congress. Rather, um, bodies uh, legislative bodies at at uh, lower levels continue to nominate to elect people to the to the uh, National People's Congress at the national level. So it starts local and then it moves up. So elections take place at the local level, and each state body, you know, um, city body, then goes on to elect people to the higher Congress. Okay, so um, the National People's Congress, um, the co Constitution re recognizes as this Chinese government's most powerful institution that uh, elects the president, approves the premier, and legitimizes policy of the executive. But in reality, it is much like we see with um, Russia. It's a rubber stamp organization for the Chinese Communist Party. All right, then we have um, separate, uh, we have the you know, the People's Republic of China, that's the government with the unicameral legislature. Then we have the Chinese Communist Party, which has its own structure. 
And so, um, as you can see from this pyramid right here, this is the structure of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, there is the Party Congress, right? And the Party Congress meets every five years, also very rubber stamp. And these people choose members to go to the Central Committee. And then these people choose people to go to the Politburo who then these people choose members to go to the Politburo Standing Committee. That is where the center of power is, right here in the Standing Committee. And it's the Standing Committee who, who basically chooses the party's general secretary, which is the highest singular office in China. So the Chinese Politburo Standing Committee of the National People's Congress which assumes the legislative duties most of the year when the NPC is not in session. Remember, the NPC, I, they only meet like twice a year. Um, so it's really the standing committee that really does the legislative functions of China, even though constitutionally it's supposed to be the National People's Congress. All right. Um, so that is China. Let's move now to Mexico. So Mexico is a presidential system, and um, it is bicameral. Uh, so far, we've seen Russia and the UK being parliamentary or parliamentary hybrid systems. China is its own thing, and now Mexico is our first presidential system. It is bicameral, and the big thing I want you to remember about Mexico's legislature is that it's democratizing due to the 2014 constitutional reforms that took effect in 2018. So both of these houses, the Chamber of Deputies and the Chamber of Senators, approve legislation, they levy taxes, they verify outcomes of elections. Um, the Senate holds additional power. So this one tends to be a little bit more, it has more power. The Senate um, confirms presidential appointments to the Supreme Court, approves treaties, and approves federal intervention in state matters. All right, um, and so uh, remember that um, this is very similar to our system where you have the lower house, the Chamber of Deputies and us, it's the House of Representatives and um, the Chamber of Senators is the upper house. For us, it's also the senators. But because of the 2014 constitutional amendments, legislators can now get reelected. Remember the succensio is only for the president now. It used to be for the Chamber of Deputies and Chamber of Senators, but as of 2018, legislators can now get reelected. Um, the Chamber of Deputies, you can go up to four consecutive three-year terms. Um, in the Senators, it's two consecutive six-year terms. And these were the last elections. You can kind of see here. This is the 20. This is the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. All right. Um, let us now move to Nigeria, also a presidential system, just like Mexico, also bicameral. Um, and the big takeaway here is regional represent, uh, representation dominates in both houses. Remember, uh, Nigeria is heavily regionalized, the north versus the south. And you can see here with that division in our um, political parties, the APC and the PDP. All right, so um, there's a wider range of ethnic division is also a big issue. There's a thousand different ethnic um, coalitions that exist. Um, so the National Assembly, this is their legislature. It's bicameral. Um, it is, it's got, it's relatively weak. Authority is weak and reflects regional representation. Both houses approve legislation. Both chambers hold the power to, to, um, to make legislation. Um, and the Senate possesses unique impeachment and confirmation powers. So Senate's got a little more power, just like we saw in Mexico, that tends to be the case in presidential systems. So the Senate, um, both elected, Senate is, is the upper house, um, three from each of the 36 states, one from the, uh, from the federal district, um, Abuja. Uh, the House of Representatives also elected the lower house by population, kind of like how we are in the United States. Um, Nigeria, though, its legislature has historically been under military governments, and under those governments, the legislatures have had no power. 
Under civilian governments, they have been under what is known as a learning process. So they're much like Mexico, they're democratizing, but Mexico's de democratizing at a much faster rate than Nigeria. And here are some examples here of how the legislature has struggled, um, you know, with, uh, with some degree of legitimacy, even though the legislature technically constitutionally has all this power, it's been undermined by the executive branch. So I told you at the beginning that there's some ways that sometimes legislatures are undermined. In Nigeria, it's been the, the autocratic or authoritarian nature of the executive branch has often just eliminated the power of the legislature. And Nigeria continues to struggle with that. Last but not least is going to be Iran. So Iran is our other uh, unicameral. China's the first one here. Uh, Iran is our second, the unicameral. And technically, it's the Mejlis. Um, they are elected um, democratic institutions, so they are they're directly elected to four-year terms. Um, candidates are, though, approved ultimately by the Supreme Leader, but more specifically by the Guardian Council. Um, they have the power to pass legislation, oversee the budget, confirm presidential nominees to the cabinet. Um, this body acts under the supervision of the Guardian Council. So realize that the Guardian Council ensures that anything passed by the Majlis is in compliance with Islam and Sharia law. So let's talk about the Guardian Council. It is more of a theocratic institution. Um, it's made up of 12 male, male clerics. Clerics are religious leaders. Uh, six appointed by the chief judge, six appointed by the, uh, by the Majlis to six-year terms. Um, candidates are all vetted um, and... Uh, and uh, by the Supreme Leader. And of course, one of their big functions is to oversee the Majlis. The Expediency Council, this is also a theocratic institution. Um, and their job is basically to negotiate any kind of problems that exist between the Majlis and the Guardian Council. So we have the Majlis, the Guardian Council, and then the Expediency Council arbitrates between these two. The Assembly of Religious Experts are democratic because they are elected. There are 88 members. Um, and you have to qualify to test to prove that you have religious qualifications uh, because you are assembly of religious experts. You have to be a religious expert. There's no clear responsibility, but they can remove the Supreme Leader. And so they're kind of what is supposed to be the oversight to the Supreme Leader. So um, I will tell you, much like we see in, um, in Russia, much like we see in Nigeria, Legislative powers can be constrained by other governmental institutions. We said that in Nigeria, it's constrained by the executive. Same thing in Iran. It's, it's constrained by the Supreme Leader. So Iran's Expediency Council, which is selected by the Supreme Leader as an advisory committee to resolve disputes between the Majlis and the Guardian Council, is selected by the Supreme Leader. So the Supreme Leader ultimately is responsible. And Iran's Guardian Council which vets candidates and oversees the Majlis to make sure law, uh, laws are in compliance with, it, with Islam. Again, the, the um, Guardian Council largely is, elect, is, is technically by the chief judge and approved by the um, Majlis, but all ultimately are accountable to the Supreme Leader. Alrighty, so that is legislature. See you guys tomorrow.